While out boating one Sunday afternoon on a billabong across the river, we saw a young man on horseback driving some horses along the bank. He said it was a fine day and asked if the water was deep there. The joker of our party said it was deep enough to drown him, and he laughed and rode farther up. We didn't take much notice of him. Next day, a funeral gathered at a corner pub and asked each other in to have a drink while waiting for the hearse. They passed away some of the time dancing jigs to a piano in the bar parlour. They passed away the rest of the time skylarking and fighting. The defunct was a young union labourer, about 25, who had been drowned the previous day while trying to swim some horses across a billabong of the Darling. He was almost a stranger in town, and the fact of his having been a union man accounted for the funeral. The police found some union papers in his swag and called at the General Labourer's Union Office for information about him. That's how we knew. The secretary had very little information to give. The departed was a Roman, and the majority of the town were otherwise. But unionism is stronger than creed. Liquor, however, is stronger than unionism, and when the hearse presently arrived, more than two-thirds of the funeral were unable to follow. The procession numbered 15, 14 souls following the broken shell of a soul. Perhaps not one of the 14 possessed a soul any more than the corpse did, but that doesn't matter. Four or five of the funeral, who were boarders at the pub, borrowed a trap which the landlord used to carry passengers to and from the railway station. There were strangers to us who were on foot and we to them. We were all strangers to the corpse. A horseman, who looked like a drover just returned from a big trip, dropped into our dusty wake and followed us a few hundred yards, dragging his pack horse behind him. But a friend made wild and demonstrative signals from a hotel veranda, hooking at the air in front with his right hand and jabbing with his left thumb over his shoulder in the direction of the bar. So the drover hauled off and didn't catch up to us any more. He was a stranger to the entire show. We walked in twos. There were three twos. It was very hot and dusty. The heat rushed in fierce, dazzling rays across every iron roof and light-coloured wall that was turned to the sun. One or two pubs closed respectfully until we got past. They closed their bar doors and the patrons went in and out through some side or back entrance for a few minutes. Bushmen seldom grumble at an inconvenience of this sort when it's caused by a funeral. They have too much respect for the dead. On the way to the cemetery, we passed three shearers sitting on the shady side of a fence. One was drunk, very drunk. The other two covered their right ears with their hands out of respect for the departed, whoever he might have been, and one of them kicked the drunk and muttered something to him. He straightened himself up, stared and reached helplessly for his hat, which he'd shoved half off and then on again. Then he made a great effort to pull himself together and succeeded. He stood up, braced his back against the fence, knocked off his hat and remorsefully placed his foot on it to keep it off his head till the funeral passed. A tall, sentimental drover who walked by my side, cynically quoted Byronic verses suitable for the occasion, to death, and asked with pathetic humour whether we thought the dead man's ticket would be recognised over yonder. It was a GLU ticket, and the general opinion was that it would be recognised. Presently, my friend said, You remember when we were in the boat yesterday, we saw a man driving some horses along the bank? Yes. Lie nodded at the hearse and said, Well, that's him. I thought a while. I didn't take any particular notice of him, I said. He said something, didn't he? Yes, he said it was a fine day. You'd have taken more notice if you'd known that he was doomed to die in the hour and that those were the last words he would say to any man in this world. To be sure, said a full voice from the rear, if you'd known that, you'd have prolonged the conversation. We plodded on across the river line and along the hot, dusty road which ran to the cemetery some of us talking about the accident and lying about the narrow escapes we have had ourselves. Presently, someone said, there's the devil. I looked up and saw a priest standing in the shade of the tree by the cemetery gate. The hearse was drawn up and the tailboards were opened. The funeral extinguished its right ear with his hat. And as four men lifted the coffin out and laid it over the grave, the priest, a pale, quiet young fellow, stood under the shade of a sapling which grew at the head of the grave. He took off his hat dropped it carelessly on the ground, and proceeded to business. I noticed that one or two heathens winced slightly when the holy water was sprinkled on the coffin. The drops quickly evaporated, and the little round black spots that were left were soon dusted over. But the spots showed, by contrast, the cheapness and shabbiness of the cloth with which the coffin was covered. It seemed black before, now it looked a dusky grey.
Just here, man's ignorance and vanity made a farce of the funeral. A big, bull-necked publican with heavy, blotchy features and a supremely ignorant expression picked up the priest's straw hat and held it about two inches over his head of reverence during the whole of the service. The father, be it remembered, was standing in the shade. A few shoved their hats on and off uneasily, struggling between their disgust for the living and their respect for the dead. The hat had a conical crown and a brim sloping down all round like a sunshade, and the publican held it with his great red claw spread over the crown. To do the priest justice, perhaps he didn't notice the incident. A stage priest or parson in the same position might have said, Put the hat down, my friend. Is not the memory of our departed brother worth more than my complexion? A wattlebark layman might have expressed himself in stronger language, nonetheless to the point. But my priest seemed unconscious of what was going on. Besides, the publican was a great and important pillar of the church. He couldn't, as an ignorant and conceited ass, lose such a good opportunity of asserting his faithfulness and importance to the church. The grave looked very narrow under the coffin, and I drew a deep breath of relief when the box slid easily down. I saw a coffin get stuck once, at Rookwood, and it had to be yanked out with difficulty and laid on the sods at the feet of the heartbroken relations, who howled dismally while the grave diggers widened the hole. But they don't cut contracts so fine in the West. Our grave digger was not altogether bowless, and our respect for the human quality described as felons, he scraped up some light and dusty soil and threw it down to deaden the fall of the clay lumps on the coffin. He also tried to steer the first few shovelfuls gently down against the end of the grave with the back of the shovel turned outwards. But the hard, dry, darling river clods rebounded and knocked all the same. It didn't matter much. Nothing does. The fall of lumps of clay on a stranger's coffin doesn't sound any different from the fall of the same things on an ordinary wooden box. At least, I didn't notice anything awesome or unusual in the sound. But perhaps one of us, the most sensitive, might have been impressed by being reminded of a burial long ago when the thump of every sod jolted his heart. I have left out the waddle because it wasn't there. I've also neglected to mention the heartbroken old mate with his grizzled head bowed and great pearly drops steaming down his rugged cheeks. He was absent. He was probably out back. For similar reasons, I have admitted reference to the suspicious moisture in the eyes of a bearded bush ruffian named Bill. Bill failed to turn up, and the only moisture was that what was induced by the heat. I have left out the sad Australian sunset because the sun was not going down at the time. The burial took place exactly at midday. The dead bushman's name was Jim, apparently. But they found no portraits, nor locks of hair, nor any love letters, nor anything of that kind in his swag. Not even a reference to his mother. Only some papers relating to union matters. Most of us didn't know the name till we saw it on the coffin. We knew him as that poor chap that got drowned yesterday. So his name's James Tyson, said my drover acquaintance, looking at the plate. Why? Didn't you know that before I asked? No. But I knew he was a union man. It turned out afterwards that JT wasn't his real name, only the name he went by. Anyhow, he was buried by it and most of the great Australian dallies have mentioned in their brevity columns that a young man named James John Tyson was drowned in a billabong of the Darling last Sunday. We did hear later on what his real name was, but if we ever chance to read it in the Missing Friends column, we shall not be able to give any information to heartbroken mother or sister or wife, nor to anyone who could let him hear something to his advantage, for we have already forgotten the name.